Hey guys, hey. welcome to another episode of the How Much Do They Make series. Mm -hmm. Today we have an awesome guest. We have a lady called Katia. Welcome Katia. Hey Katia. Hi, thank you for having me on the series. Yeah. Awesome. So Katia, guys, is a lecturer. Um, Katia, would you just like to tell us a bit about you, you know, what you do and how you got into it? So my name is Katia Vioni. I am a lecturer in psychology at a university in the UK. Um, since I started my BSc in psychology, I knew I wanted an academic career. Mm -hmm. So I tried to get the opportunities to work towards this. So then after my BSc in psychology, I did a master's in psychology. And after that, I did a PhD in psychology. After that, I applied for quite a few jobs. And then I landed this one um, as an online lecturer, actually. So what does it mean when you talk about uh, an online lecturer? Does that mean you don't actually go into lecture halls to do your lecturing? Yes, precisely. So the program, programs that I teach, they are fully online uh, and they are at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. We do have once in a year that there is a module that students come to campus. So our students are everywhere in the world, but all of our lectures, uh, all the program is run online. Um, although I do go to the university when well, I used to, now at the moment, um, it's, com it's possible to do everything online. How important, given you're a major in psychology, how important is psychology for, when you think about money? Day to day. I think it's extremely important because by understanding how we think and how we behave, we kind of understand our decision making, we kind of understand when we might be acting based on our instincts or if we're actually reasoning about a choice that we are making. Um, so if we think about the whole behavioral economics, that's grounded in psychology, a very key area in psychology, so yeah, it is extremely important. It's an area of psychology that overlaps with economics and perhaps even other areas. And we basically study how people think, their decision making, um, and that would be involved, uh, not just financial decisions, but any decision that might have like cost and benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to understand uh, which areas of the brain are being used, uh, which previous assumptions we make when we're making those decisions. So is this area where I would say psychology kind of marries economics. Excellent. Awesome. So tell us, Katia, what does a day in the life of a psychology lecturer typically look like for you? So it is on paper a nine to five job. So I have to be available for my students from nine to five. Because I am an online lecturer, so when I start my day, I go to our discussion boards, and that's where most of the teaching happens. So I check, are there any activities that the students post, and then I give feedback. After that, I go to my emails, and then I see if there are any more personal questions that the students uh, want to discuss on emails. Um, there's also project supervision, so when students are doing like their independent studies, we supervise them on a piece of research. There is personal academic tutoring that is like more one-to-one -one attention, but most of teaching is asynchronous because our students are everywhere, different time zones. So to make sure everyone has equal access. So what would you say are the top three things, there could be habits uh, that have made you a success at what you do today? I think there are two key ones that is time management and priorities management. It's quite easy to see everything as a priority because I need to teach, I need to supervise students, I need to do research, I need to write publications, I re need to write grant applications. And if you think about everything seems to have the same importance, but I have to manage them based on the time that I have. So it's a combination of time management um, and priority management, but also a, lo a lot of resilience because it okay. is an area that we are always judged on our performance. It, it's easy to take things personally. So you have to be resilient to understand that it's not about me personally, that the no's that I might get for a grant application or for a publication that I submit, it's not about me. It's about that particular work and things that the feedback that is actually there to help me improve. I love that mindset and we'll, we'll get more into the challenging aspects of it. But first, can you just tell us what do you love about your job? I love the opportunity to meet so many different people. Um, my colleagues are from many different places. So it's a, there's a lot of diversity in the academic environment and that is good. There could be more, of course, but I think uh, it's an open environment for different ideas, for diversity. 
I meet students from everywhere in the world. And I do like the flexibility that comes with it, especially being an online lecturer. I can yeah. manage my time almost in the way that I want, obviously, with my contract limitations. But it brings me a lot of flexibility. And even to take my holidays, I can kind of take wow. holidays almost whenever I want. And I think that is a real privilege. That's awesome. awesome. So given that, though, what would you say the most challenging aspect of what you do as an online lecturer? The aspect that I mentioned before about being constantly evaluated and there's yeah. that criticism uh, regarding your work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also difficult to establish a good work-life balance. Uh, one of the things in academia, there's always the feeling that I could be doing more because there's always a new paper that's out that I could read. There's yeah. always a new study that I could do. So if if I don't monitor myself, it's tempting to think that I have to be always working on, the, on those things because maybe someone else is doing more. Mm -hmm. So avoiding that comparison and making sure I keep a good work-life balance to avoid burning out, I think that's the most challenging thing. Yeah, it's interesting you said, I was thinking that, you know, these intellectual environments, although they might not seem it, they, they, to me, they strike me as some of the most competitive environments, because I guess the way in which you measure success in that environment is, have you published a paper or have you, you know, you know th that sort of stuff, lots yeah. of kind of in more non-obvious things. It's not really more, it might, it might, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's not really more about how much money are you making more than somebody else, but more, more intellectually, um, you know, how you perceived to perhaps rank against somebody else. Is that, is there some truth to that or not? Yes, definitely. Um, I, even though we do kind of seek promotions, but academic success is really not about how much money you make. It's mm -hmm. which level you are in the academic ladder. It's how many publications you have. It's how many grants you receive to fund your own research and the size of those grants. Uh, so like a multi-million pound grant, that's amazing, wow. but it's really rare. But so that's kind of dream. Like, can I get like a million pounds to fund my research? Mm -hmm. But some, in certain areas, we are as happy when we get 5,000 pounds. Yeah. So yes, there are the way that money comes into it is not necessarily about the salaries, about how that uh, how much money you attract to your institution and to fund your own research. Cool. Interesting. That leads us to the next question, actually, um, which is how much do you actually make per month and per annum as a psychology lecturer and through what different sources? Yes. So I make about 2200 a month uh, and that's roughly 37000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, I am a considered early career, so I've been doing this for four years, but the range can go higher than this. In the academic scale of things, um, the maximum is around 100,000 when you get to professorship. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's really towards the end of your career when you're really established. Mm -hmm. And it depends very much on the institution, but the bigger universities, the Russell Group, it might be around 100,000. Right. And then there's also the management side of things. So if I were to try to become a dean of a college or even a vice chancellor, mm -hmm. then there are vice chancellors that probably make more than a hundred thousand right. per year just to check as well one thing i noticed when i when i used to go to when i was at university and when i did my masters i used to have this i guess a, a lecturer in accountancy and one thing she said she came from the corporate world and she went and became a lecturer i was thinking to myself why would you do that and she said something about the pensions being really good for for you know in academia uh, i do think that's the case is there are different pension schemes depending mm -hmm. on the university but for instance the pension scheme that i am if i'm not mistaken i contribute around nine percent mm -hmm. and the contribution from the university i believe is 14 percent wow okay so that's very good and it's wow. not exactly final salary but it's yeah it's a combination so it, it is a very good pension i think compared to to the private sector. Yeah. Relatively, it's pretty good. I think the lecturer I was talking about, she was on a defined benefit pension scheme. So, uh, you know, it's fine, final salary type pension scheme. But even with you, I mean, your 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 pension scheme is excellent for what you're getting. I mean, I many people would, many people would pretty much bite your arm off for that. That is incredible, getting fourteen percent per year from your employer. Are you? I'm curious though. You know, you mentioned that you write grants and stuff like that, which. You know, it's quite a skill to write grants applications. Do you think that that skill makes you more entrepreneurial 
Because a lot of people who start businesses, if they want to really grow their businesses, need to apply for funding, they need to go and try and raise some money. Mm-hmm. And I think there are transferable skills from writing grant applications to trying to raise funding for a business. Is that, do you think that has made you more entrepreneurial or is that kind of frowned upon entrepreneurship as a lecturer? It's more the latter. I, I don't think the mentality in academia is still quite there in terms of dividing your time between your academic job and perhaps a more entrepreneur sort of side of things okay. uh, where you might have a consultancy company. Some academics do. And I have just woken up to this quite recently. So I've, mm-hmm. I've just started to do these kinds of things. Uh, okay. And I do think that the skills that I have from my academic role, they do benefit me when it comes to these other aspects. Um, so, yeah, it's not something very common. Some okay. academics do they stick to the academic role and right. the extra time is dedicated to just more publications and more right. uh, grants that they might write. Do you know what? That says to me there's an opportunity there because if you're a lecturer and you are very good at your lecturing but you've also found a way to generate an ex- extra income mm-hmm. by using your transferable skills, yeah. you might be that person who's actually teaching other lecturers how to do the same thing because that might create a niche for you because like that sounds to me like it's quite a lot of demand and many lecturers are looking for somebody else who's done it, mm. who can show them perhaps how to do it. So that might be an idea to consider. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said, writing down the idea. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. So you did kind of touch on it briefly, but do you actually have any plans of increasing your level of income? And what do you plan on doing differently? So since this whole situation that we're in, it's something that I had in mind before, but it just accelerated um, my approach is to have multiple streams of income. Mm-hmm. So I have started my own business last year okay. and I do slightly different things. So I do, I mentor students okay. who are doing postgraduate studies and want to do a similar career. So okay. I sometimes mentor them regarding their specific project or just about the career trajectory okay. and helping them organize themselves because you need good like organizational skills to, to do well. I also do statistical consultancies, both both academic and also private. So last year I've done a consultancy for a marketing company in Brazil, for instance. Uh, they have the means, but they don't have the skills to analyze the data, for instance, or even how to create a good questionnaire to ask the right questions. So yeah. that sort of consultancy. Um, and because I'm a native Portuguese speaker, I'm from Brazil, I do translation as well, academic wow. translations uh, from English. The idea is that with time and with this experience doing more consultancy and more mentoring, I could Mm -hmm. scale that the business having online courses. Yes. uh, That I dedicate my time to build that course. And then after that, it's just the maintenance. It's not as much time that I need to dedicate. If you've got your links to your business, whether it's your mentoring aspect, whether Mm -hmm. it's your translation, we're going to put those links below if you just share them with us in case anybody wants to connect with you and want to learn from you, we can share those details for people to click through and reach out to you. Uh, The thing I wanted to ask you, Katia, was imagine someone's watching this right now and they said, you know what, I kind of love Katia's vibe. I love her job. I love that I could lecture from home. What top three pieces of advice would you give somebody who wants to get to where you are today and potentially better in the future? I think the main one is to choose good people to work with you. Maybe some people have the impression that this academic journey is lonely, but the truth is you need to be working with good people to, it's it's not easy to do a study on your own, write a publication, submit, do the amendments and all of that. It's it's nearly impossible to do well if you don't have good collaborations. So build those collaborations as early as possible. My key collaborators are are people that I, I met when I was an undergraduate student. And I still keep those relationships. Um, And then I've been obviously trying to expand my network, but that's really, really important. Be ambitious in the sense that if you think, oh, maybe I can't go to this place or to another place. If you ask me 15 years ago, did I think I would be living in the UK? Would I ever think I would get a job in a UK university? Not really, but I accepted that I would try and I would be ambitious. So I did a PhD in the UK. Don't don't think that because your background 
would keep you from reaching those places. And be persistent. It's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that you need to try multiple times. I applied for 25 jobs to get one. So wow. Okay. So clearly you are, you're determined, you're persistent, yeah. you can network mm, and, you know, awesome. yeah. And, and you're clearly creative as well in trying, making sure that you are building good relationships and ex- extending your, your pool of kind of net, you know, networks that you have. So that's really, really fantastic advice. Exactly. Totally. So Katie, you touched um, earlier on behavioral psychology. Can you tell us what your personal relationship is with money? Um, I don't class myself as a big spender. I class myself as a big saver. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I believe that I have to live below my means, mm-hmm. but I don't have to be counting the pennies all the time. I believe in trying to make more money than instead of trying to save more money. Obviously, I am in a privileged position that I can do that. If I couldn't, then yes, I would look for places to cut down my, my expenses. But because I am able to work more, mm-hmm. that's where I'm going. I will still I want to keep saving the same rate of savings, but I want to work more so I can have uh, a bit more to expend and a bit more to send to, to save mm-hmm. and spend. Yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned your Portuguese heritage. Um, What would you say you learned about money growing up from your parents? I'm originally from from Brazil. Uh, I learned from my dad that it's really important to save, especially for the rainy days. Um, My dad is a big saver. And my mom, she used to be a big spender. I think she got better with time. Um, But it comes from their own experiences of having and not having much money growing up. So my mom had the mentality of, I worked so hard to get where I am that I want to give myself the life that I'm allowed to have now that I'm born. So I understand that. And then with time, she started to be a bit more of a saver. Uh, So I learned that that it's important to save, um, to make sure that you can cover yourself in the case of an emergency, but also to allow yourself to also live a little bit talking about living a little bit what would you say you currently spend most of your money on per month but also what do you spend your money on to treat yourself my saving is about 45 percent of my earnings wow 45 percent yes (laughs) um wow and sorry and what part of the country do you live in because many people will be wondering how on earth is she able to save 45 percent yes um i live in the midlands in derby Right. So ahead. it's a it's a good area in terms of it's very low living costs and mm-hmm. there are nice things around. Uh, there's a lot of nature around, so I think it's a very good place to live. I'm also very fortunate that I don't have a mortgage and I don't have a rent. I live with mm-hmm. my partner uh, in his property, so that allows me to save as much. Um, so around 16% are fixed bills, so mm-hmm. that's quite good as well. Um, and I would say that probably it's, I spend around 28% on food and other things that I want, like, just like for the monthly living. For treating myself, the occasional takeaway, maybe once every other week. Okay. Um, I, I give myself mentally a rough number per day. So let's say if I want to buy some, I kind of think, how many days do I have to save to then be able to buy that without compromising my monthly budget? When you think about growing up, can you think of a specific money mistake or regret growing up? And what have you learned from it? Well, I think my biggest mistake was not trying to diversify my income streams earlier. I never spent more than I had. Mm-hmm. For most of my life, I didn't have a whole lot. Uh, it took me too many years to know about investments. So I I would hear about it and people would say something instead of just being more proactive and researching and starting that like 10 years ago when I could have done it uh, and also trying to establish my business a bit earlier and and feel more confident that about having these different um, sources of income. But in terms of spending more money or spending something that I shouldn't have, there isn't anything like too big that happened actually. So Katia, tell us, what would you say is your ultimate financial goal? If I'm allowed to be quite ambitious, I would like to have at least a million pounds invested by the time I'm 55. Mm -hmm. Um, If that's like the ambition, Mm -hmm. I will 
work towards it, but I will obviously be very happy with whatever happens. I will, mm-hmm. I'll put the effort. If the result's going to be there, great. If it's not, um, it's still worth trying. Think about retirement around that time. I love that. Would you, I'm curious, so why a million pounds? And secondly, if you could choose a part of the world to retiring, where, where in the world would it be? The figure is basically the calculation that I've done in terms of how much I need to keep my current standards. Yeah, I think in terms of retirement, I'm not sure. I do love living in the UK, so it is a possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have considered maybe south of Italy or south of Portugal, okay. south of Spain, um, a nice warm area. If I had to go and learn more about behavioral psychology, what books or resources might you recommend or podcasts or anything like that um, to look into to learn more about it? Uh, anything done by Daniel Kenman. Uh, so the book Think Fast and Slow. And I think there's a new book called Nudge. Yeah. Uh, everything that he has done, um, I would say it's it's in the top. Right. Okay. Excellent. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we've got both of those books, although I I I haven't read them yet. I've we, read a bit of Nudge. Mary's read read Nudge. Yeah. Yeah. Really good book. I need to finish it. There's also a lot from I forgot the name of the author, but the book is Anti Fragile. Okay. So okay. anything from that author is also around that area of how we think and make decisions. Nice. I'll be Check checking it out. out. Is there anyone you watch on YouTube, by the way, about just to kind of learn how they think and how they explore psychology is there anybody you any resource like that no i haven't been looking into that that much because that's one part of the business that i'm developing that we're going to develop at some point so um, i still have to do the market research awesome thank you guys we just want to say this is obviously a series we've done many other interviews that you'd find super interesting lots of really interesting personalities we've interviewed surgeons surgeons Doc, uh, doctors, obviously, <laughs> accountants, Gamers, engineers, yeah, music producers, yeah. coaches, YouTubers. Yeah. So we've kept it very diverse, lots of people from different parts of the country. Um, and it's there's so much wisdom in this series. So we're going to put links to lots of those videos below if you guys head over and binge on this playlist. And honestly, you can learn so much from listening to people. Katia, we want to thank you specifically thank for you joining so us much. today. You've brought so much to our platform. And we're really thankful that you applied, you know, when we gave the call to action on our communities tab, that you actually reached out and said you wanted to be interviewed. So thank you for doing that. Um, how can people reach you? My Twitter account. Um, yeah. okay. And I think that would be the primary place for now. Thank you so much again, Katia. Um, guys, show her some love. We're going to put some information like details in the description of her business. So do check it out, guys, and show her some love. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you. And as ever, in all things, be, be thankful, thankful and, and seek joy. joy. Take care. Take care, people. Bye. Bye, Bye Katia. See you.